So a very good uh, afternoon uh, for the for our seminar of the Collaborative Research Center Origin and Function of um, Meat Organisms. It's a great pleasure to have uh, our seminar speaker Jason Steik uh, from uh, University of California in Riverside with us. Good morning, Jason. It's 6 a.m. in Riverside. We had a uh, we had a kind of a miscalculation of our time zones, and so, but Jason kindly replied that it's not a big problem. He has his coffee next to him. He's fully functioning. I had a chat with him before, and so we are very much, uh, very much looking forward to have uh, Jason Steig here. Uh, Jason Steig is an expert in fungi genomics and uh, genetics. Uh, and was identified actually and brought to us by Eva Stuckenbrock. And Eva will also chair the question and answering session after Jason's talk. Uh, Jason was, um, got his education at Duke University uh, with a bachelor in um, computer sciences. And uh, then got a, stayed in Duke, got his PhD in genetics. And after a postdoc, then he moved to um, a, a postdoc in uh, Berkeley. He, he moved to the University of California in Riverside, where he is since then. And in the meantime, he's uh, a full professor there. Jason is one of the uh, leading experts, as you can imagine, from his academic training, um, being a computational um, and a computer science expert uh, and a fungi uh, scholar, uh, one of the leading experts in fungi in modern fungi research and genetics. He shares with Eva Stuckenbrock his membership and fellowship in uh, in the CIFA program, uh, Fungi Kingdom. And today it's our great pleasure that we finally realize that metaorganisms do not only contain a microbiome consisting of bacteria, archaea, viruses, but also fungi. We miss that um, a lot, and uh, that's another reason why we are so happy to have Jason uh, with us. He brings the fungi now in uh, more in focus, and uh, he will talk now, and Jason, the floor is yours, on dynamic discoveries of fungi bacteria and fungi viral interactions. Very much looking forward to your talk, Jason. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, the chance to share with you. Um, and I want to give you a, uh, an overview of some of the research questions that have been driving us recently and, uh, and, and introduce a little bit more about fungi to you. Um, so our, um, you know, our work starts from an appreciation of the, the, the diversity of fungi and the sort of really interesting dynamic uh, interactions they have with other hosts. And, and um, the, this is a, a depiction from uh, some, some plates from a, a chapter that we wrote a couple of years ago, but just to kind of remind you of some of the different major um, clades of fungi and, and, and sort of both macro and micro appreciation of, of their beauty and also just the diversity of what, uh, of what forms they take. And, um, trying to understand how, you know, from a single origin, this kingdom derived this, this fantastic, uh, diversity that, you know, we, we might appreciate, uh, the, the different types of mushrooms, but there are just incredible different micro, uh, structures that are part of, you know, sexual reproduction and, and the interactions that these fungi have, uh, with hosts. So just wanted to make sure that you kind of, understand where, where we've come from in terms of really being motivated by that diversity. Uh, the um, phylogenetic relationships of, of, of these organisms within the kingdom has been driving a lot of the research questions that that I got started in and um, I was and I feel very lucky to have come in a time when a lot of uh, the, the technology uh, allowed us to, to, to sample and explore uh, the the, the genes and then later the genomes of these organisms. And so this is a tree of um, some of the major uh, phyla in bold here and then um, um, subphyla in, in these my mycotinas, as you can see at the end. And so these represent kind of our appreciation for these, these major groups. And you might recognize things like mushrooms here. And then some of these uh, other, other uh, images show you some of the different uh, structures. And so um, there's, there's, you know, 
what one could spend a lecture on each each little picture here and talk more about it. But I want to give you some uh, some sense of kind of these are the major major groups of of, of fungi, and um, we're you know, we're interested in both resolving these relationships using phylogenetic approaches and understanding how traits evolve throughout the kingdom. So um, I'll just give you another kind of just background on what we're what we've been doing to try to you know further fill in those those lineages is um, uh, our efforts as well as as many others to try to sequence genomes across the kingdom, and one project that's in collaboration with the, the Joint Genome Institute here in California um, is to uh, sequence you know we we gave a big number a thousand fungal genomes, um, and the efforts were really to emphasize sampling diversity across the kingdom so that we would have more understanding of that diversity. A lot of the sequencing projects at the beginning were driven by medical or agricultural focused lineages. But, you know, once you get through those, um, you know, it's really important to sample the diversity too. And so, um, you know, we want to use these data to understand how things like gene content has changed over time so that we can understand if a pathogen um, has, you know, Gain, gained new function, um, maybe we can understand the, the, the genetic basis from that through our comparative approaches. And then one focus project within this is called, we call Zygolife for the Zygomycete fungi, which are these two lineages, uh, um, two phyla that, that um, previously the, the, the relationships weren't quite understood. Um, and we, we use genomic sequencing um, and, and uh, microscopy and other approaches to try to understand better uh, that group. And so I'll, I'll give you some, some results from the, those projects. So here's just a, a kind of a high level overview of genomes. <laughs> so um, there's lots, lots that one can talk about with genomes, but um, here's a, a graph of, of a thousand uh, and a little, little less, little over a thousand um, fungal genomes that were, uh, that are available. And you can see a distribution of size of the genome on the x-axis and the number of genes in the, on the y-axis. And so you can see there's a linear relationship, right? As you have a bigger genome, you, you tend to have more genes, right? There's more real estate for those genes to live in. Um, hopefully you can see in yellow, there are these, some of these really smaller um, sized genomes, which also have fewer genes. Um, and uh, these are the microsporidia, which, which are, are obligate parasites for the most part of, of, um, of animal hosts. And so they are, um, uh, they tend to have very streamlined reduced genomes. And so it's interesting to kind of uh, you know, see, see that pattern versus some of the fungi that are over here on the right-hand side are, are at the level of a gigabase. We, we've just sequenced um, two or three fungi now that are in the 1.1 um, gigabase range that are insect associated. Um, and you can see what's interesting though is of course their size is large, but their gene content hasn't necessarily gone up uh, commiserate with that because the rest of the genome is contains transposable elements, we believe. And so um, trying to understand the, the evolutionary pressures and the dynamics that um, allow or, or have enabled that sort of takeover of, of transposons in those genomes is also kind of a driving question. So at any rate, these are kind of high level views of the data sets that, that, we, that we've been developing. And another kind of um, product of that is, is these big phylogenetic trees, which, you know, it's really hard to look at in, in one page. But here's a, um, here's a recent um, result that, uh, uh, where we've published a, a tree with, with 1,640 fungal genomes. And we can use this to both test hypotheses about the, these relationships of these different subphyla and phyla. Even, even though we, we kind of draw them as well resolved, there are places in the tree that even with lots of data, we still have challenges in trying to resolve. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's still an ongoing problem to, to to, to get there. So anyways, these are just some, some high level approaches that we've been using to try to you know, understand these relationships between the organisms um, phylogenetically. But I also wanna talk about other kinds of relationships, which are the relationships between the fungi and other microbes. And so we've been, um, this is increasingly an appreciated uh, field. Um, this actually isn't a very fancy photo. This is a picture of, of coffee, coffee grounds that sat out for too long and, and then um, uh, someone decided to put on the microscope and look at it. So I always try, try to challenge members of my lab to we do a call it culture challenge sometimes to say, well, find something that you didn't know about and let's see if we can identify it. So they get their picture on the slide here. But um, I think it's important to think about not only these fungi, but also what, what who are they interacting with? So I'm going to tell you three stories. The first one's going to take a little bit, most of my time, but then um, uh, and this is going to be about fungi in, in, uh, in dry environments. And then I'll talk some more about um, fungal bacterial interactions, and then just a short overview of some of our viral work that's, that's really kind of just emerging. So um, 
And this is kind of a tale of two store, uh, two projects. They're both about dry environments. One of those environments is very cold in Antarctica, and one of those is a, is a bit hotter. It's in the desert um, uh, just down the road from, from where I am. And so um, it, this has all benefited from incredible collaborators. I kind of bring my expertise but um, uh, on the, the computational work, but, um, but Laura Selbelman has been uh, uh, just an incredible uh, collaborator and expert who Brought, allowed me to come in and help participate in some of this work where she, she goes to Antarctica, uh, collects uh, these rocks, um, and they're really interested in the, the microbial communities that, that inhabit these because in these dry valleys, there's nothing else kind of visibly growing in these, in these sort of extreme environments um, that you can see. But if you actually open up these rocks, you can see these layers where there are uh, endoliths that are, that are uh, thriving within there. And some of those endolithic organisms are, are fungi. So we'll talk about that. And then the other side, I'll talk about um, these uh, biological crusts in the desert, where also we have um, cooperation between fungi and bacteria, um, and, and in some cases, mosses and whatnot. So there's, there's um, kind of two stories, but it's both about water. So the work in our Antarctica that, um, that Laura's group has done um, in, involves both sampling in, the, in some of these different um, uh, parts of Antarctica, um, and then um, doing, taking those, those rocks, um, you know, breaking them open, extracting the material from inside, and then doing sequencing uh, of those. And so we, we did we, um, uh, us and others have done amplicon sequencing of those uh, um, of those samples to look at what fungi are present from a uh, molecular approach. There's been um, culture-based approaches where we can also um, isolate uh, uh, living organisms from there and use those in, in further genome studies and, and, and um, uh, experimental biology. And so these have been kind of the resources that um, that have, that have been developing. And again, trying to understand, or one of the driving questions within this is trying to understand how these organisms are, um, are interacting in these zones. Um, and um, to what extent is there cooperation? I mean, these are, these are sort of systems where we have to, you know, crack them open and kind of take them at, at in stasis right there. We can't, right now do a lot of good experiments to study uh, the dynamics interaction. We kind of have to take a snapshot of that. But um, a lot of the microscopy and the culture-based work um, have been able to kind of establish some of these different relationships and understanding how the rocks provide this environment that you know is buffered from the temperature changes um, and um, uh, provides a place for some of that moisture to accumulate. And that's where you get this kind of small, um, small bursts of growth that, that, that can occur at the right times. And so that's really what I think for me is I'm really interested in how do these fungi and how do all these microbes kind of persist through these periods of, of um, limited growth, then they receive a signal, presumably water in some ways, and then they're able to sort of initiate growth and, and but, but do that in a way that still allows them to go back through another drawing cycle. Um, and so, um, you know, another so, so they, there's sort of both you know, observational studies of that, um, some of the culture-based studies, and then um, we've also been able to apply shotgun metagenomics to these these problems um, to try to get a better snapshot of the of the organisms that are there. Um, you know, there's different advantages to these amplicon studies versus the the shotgun metagenome. So, with the Joint Genome Institute, um, we had a um, uh, you know a community sequencing project, a pilot project to be able to sequence. Uh, uh, 18 or 20 of these um, sites, uh, these different rocks. And then um, we were able to pull out the bacteria. So we'll talk a little bit about bacteria, pull out the bacteria from those, meta uh, from those metagenomes to build these metagenome assembled genomes of those. This is of course is a complicated um, uh, figure here that, I, that you won't be able to totally digest, but um, this is a tree of the bacteria that are found. The, the, the inner circle are all the different samples from the different sites in Antarctica. Um, and then you've got these different um, major uh, phyla um, listed in color in the outside ring. And so we've identified, for example, down here in blue, some novel bacterial lineages that um, when, we, when we also apply a, a dating, uh, um, a, a calibration to this phylogenetic tree, we can um, identify that they've really been established um, after the um, uh, after the Antarctic continent split off, but also that they don't really have any relatives um, close to them. So they're kind of off on their own on this part of the tree. And so again, uh, you know, the, the, the importance of these discoveries that we can make from these approaches then allow us to, to maybe emphasize uh, microbes to, to spend more time thinking about. So, you know, again, these metagenomic approaches, you know, 
look at the whole community, but then separate out, in this case, individual microbes that we want to we want to know how how abundant they are, um, and then you know potentially their their metabolic uh, activity and uh, and whatnot from there. So these are um, again, I guess the the <laughs> the, the beginning of some of those studies uh, that this this allows us to do. And so we're doing the same thing with fungi, although unfortunately the fungi in these metagenome stu uh, studies are just a, a less abundant. And so we, we have a harder time getting really good uh, genomes from the shotgun approaches. So um, work I'm not going to sh show here, but we've, we've got cultures from hundreds of um, Antarctic fungi that, that, that Laura and, and the team in Italy have cultured. And so we've, we've begun sequencing those um, and um, uh, trying to use that to understand the, the adaptations that they have. So um, what's interesting to me was a group of the fungi that we find in those um, culture-based and amplicon-based are what we call black fungi. And those are um, uh, melanized fungi that are fill, fill out two phylogenetic, um, two, two independent phylogenetic clades. And so, um, you know, at the time I, I just, you know, we sort of saw those as abundant. We were kind of working on it. And at the same time, I had a student that um, we had decided to focus on um, what are the fungi in the desert? Um, you know, it's, it's nice to have a project where you can drive out uh, quickly and go out to the go out to your study site, and um, although maybe not as beautiful as some of the forests in Germany, um, we still get a chance to um, uh, tr you know spend a little time outside, but also thinking about organisms in their environment. And so um, uh, this is a you know, kind of a close up picture of one of these crusts, which are in this case a lichenized crust. So there's lichens that are growing on this soil, and you can see here on the right hand side that these crusts. Um, I mean, they they we call them crusts because they really have a structure. They have a they have a as a top layer of that soil. These little things that are hanging down here are actually pieces of soil that are attached by a thin filament, and that filament is a cyanobacterium. And you can actually see them. They're so strong and so so thick, you can see them with your eye. Um, and so that's what these, these, these crusts are, these, these communities there. And so um, lots of work or has been done on, on, on crusts in the systems, but a lot of it's been focused on the cyanobacteria, right? The, the photosynthetic members of these communities. Um, you know, these are important ecologically uh, in terms of carbon, um, carbon cycles in the desert. Um, but, um, you know, we, we wanted to know what, it, what what are the other fungi, what are the fungi doing in these systems? In addition to, of course, these visible lichens, what else is in these crusts and what, what are their, what are their processes? And so, uh, what are their biological processes? So just, I mean, a, a very high level view of some of these different types of crusts there, they, you know, they can have these different structures um, in the desert. They can be made up of what we call smooth crusts, or maybe they're only cyanobacteria and there aren't any lichens. And so it just kind of looks like soil, but it actually has a structure to it. So that's, that's what kind of defines it for these crusts. And then you have these different, um, you know, different variants on this, depending on, on kind of the membership of the community. So again, these are communities. And the other reason why we've been interested in them is, you know, these are, um, these are symbioses between a bacteria, the, the, the photosynthetic bacteria and other, other microbes, including fungi. And that's also what a lichen is, right? A lichen is this partnership between a, photo, a photobiont and a mycobiont. Um, and so we also wonder if these dry environments um, force these cooperations um, or, or at least, you know, make them more important. And so are these good models for kind of proto, not necessarily lichen, themselves, but proto lichens of kind of what 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 are some of the forces that that encourage that cooperation. So that's another kind of motivating factor. But uh, you know, it's still some of the work requires a lot of this kind of fundamental understanding of who's there um, and using molecular approaches. And so we both can culture the fungi from these crusts um, and then. Um, and use that to try to classify, of course, you know, visibly, but also by sequence-based um, uh, approaches, um, who, who is part of who, uh, which fungi um, are part of this and which bacteria are part of um, these, these communities. And, and again, some of these communities are lichen, there's a lichen kind of on the top surface, and some of them have mosses um, as part of the, that, um, that community. And, and so they're, they're, they're different ages, there's, there's a succession to some extent in some of these crusts. You kind of have um, these lichen crusts can take seven to 10 years to form. And so, um, you know, prior to that, they look kind of more just like the, what we call the smooth crust, where there's only really just some, um, some structure, but they're not, uh, they don't have a visible lichen. And then the other important part is the, is the 
um, the green component of these, the partner, and this is work that is led, uh, that is that Nicole Petrasiak, who's at New Mexico State, um, um, is a taxonomist and a, and a microbiologist who, who focuses on these cyanobacteria that are found in these terrestrial environments. And her work, again, inspired us. We, 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 are, we feel lucky to be able to collaborate with her um, on understanding the, the, the microbes that are there. And so both by culture-based studies and amplicon studies, we can identify them as well as um, we now have, a, actually didn't update the, the, the citation, but we um, just published last, last month a um, uh, 50 genomes from these from cultures of terrestrial cyanobacteria, um, and one thing that's um, interesting if you ever worked in these systems is that these these cyanos produce a lot of um, extra uh, sacchar uh, EPS these um, uh, extra polysaccharides extracellular poly polysaccharides and they are very sticky and so what happens is these cultures are hard to get pure for just the cyanobacterium so when we sequence all of these genomes we're actually sequencing cultures and so we can identify the cyano component of that genome but then we have a metagenome but then we have to we also are looking at well are there specific other bacteria that are that are interacting and cooperating so these are fantastic fascinating systems on their own. And we're trying to look at them in the context of these um, crusts. Here's a couple of, of slides on um, the uh, microbial ecology questions we've been asking about these different crust types. So these are abbreviations on the x-axis here of these different types of crusts like light algal or cyanolichen or green lichen crusts. These, these two are, these are the moss crusts. And so just at a high level overview, you can see that there are different patterns of fungi that are found within these different crust types. There are different levels of alpha diversity um, in terms of the, 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 the breadth of the types of fungi that are found in those. Um, and so we can, you know, we can zoom in on these different major uh, classes of fungi. Most of the makeup of these are um, in this figure especially, but, um, but in general are ascomycete fungi. Um, um, that just, that tends to be the dominant, although there are mushroom forming fungi, agaricomycetes you can see here that do um, have a presence here and there are desert mushrooms. And so um, we can, we can kind of uh, identify those as well. So we can also use these, um, this is based on amplicon studies of these of um, a set of crusts. We can also try to identify um, interactions, so we can develop a network of those fungal bacterial interactions by looking at kind of correlations in the abundances, and then use um, uh, you know th these kinds of visualization techniques to try to, to to show you the predicted linkages between certain um, say fungi here. So like lichenomycetes are the lichen typically lichenized fungi, and their and their association with the cytobacteria, um, and so. Um, again, sometimes these high level uh, pictures only just sort of give you a, a snapshot of what's there, but it starts to help us identify um, patterns that we can look at how they how these patterns might change on different crust types or after disturbance. Um, and so these are these are kind of establishing the beginning questions for that. We also look at the surface that you've looked at, but we also look at the soil underneath the crust to try to understand the composition of the soils. And what we what we did find, and there's lots of stuff packed into these papers um, is that the, the, the soils underneath the crusts are actually quite similar, even though the crust type might be different or the area where you sampled is, is you know, many, uh, many kilometers uh, away, the so subsurface soil tends to be fairly similar, um, whereas the, the top uh, changes a lot. So that's another kind of, you know, interesting component about what, you know, about what's stabilizing that in, the, in these desert soils. Um, and so one other question that, that relates to this is how these communities um, interact is um, we want to look at time. And so we, um, again, took advantage of the fact that we could drive out to the desert. Um, and so once a, once a month, um, my student would go out and sample a set of uh, one location and, and collect these from these three different types of cross uh, samples, as well as we would kind of opportunistically sample um, uh, after it rained. So we'd kind of wait a couple of days after there's been a rainfall event and also try to capture that. And so um, again, these are just, um, you know, bu bu busy figures to try to get, to try to get through, um, uh, Totally, but these are basically each dot is a sample here. This is an NMDS plot or PCOA plot of these um, of the beta diversity of these uh, different um, 
sites. And so you can see that these are different, like the, the color, basically the colors are grouping here um, so that the different cross, uh, different so, uh, sample types uh, tend to look more similar to each other. That's what we'd hope. Um, and that the, um, they're sort of distinctly different. And then if we kind of break it down by, um, uh, by cross type, you can again see that the, the, the LAC, these light algal crusts tend to have one pattern, whereas these GLC and CLC tend to have some overlap. So that's another um, way that we've, uh, we've we've looked at that sort of the crust type. And then if we um, uh, add time, the time variable to this, then um, what we can see is that um, this, this is focusing on the bacteria. We have a fungal component, but I'm, I'm not gonna show here, but, but um, it, it's also dynamic, but here's the bacterial component. And you can see um, that the cyanobacteria are the in green here kind of dominate, but that there's variation over time in the community structure. Um, and so that's an interesting, uh, you know, interesting observations. And then we can start to fit different kind of variables to that understanding or different environmental parameters to that to try to understand what might help explain some of that. So we looked at, of course, um, what the, the dew point, what, you know, basically how much water might have been available at different times of the year based on weather station data. Um, and then um, uh, we sort of to distill it down, we looked at a bunch of different variables that are up at the top here. And what we were actually able to discern for some of these that was quite interesting was um, how much wind speed, how much the, the, the wind uh, blowing around presumably spores and whatnot really had an impact on some of the um, the diversity that we saw in the months later. And so the previous month's wind speed was actually an important variable as we kind of dug down into this as well as some other components. And so different um, microbes reacted to these different variables different, uh, differently. Um, and we also um, of course have a corollary one to, to the, the fungi, but the, the bacterial one was a little bit more robust in our, in our first analysis. So that's why I'm, I'm showing you that here, but this is kind of driving the questions that we wanted to that we're going to continue to try to understand these communities. And so again, like some of the fungi that we find are these black fungi um, that are also found uh, really dominant in the crust and certain crust types. And that's similar to what we also know from the Antarctic environments. And so we, we know that these are really extremophile fungi that can survive, you know, high radiation um, from the sun and, and, and these, these, uh, these, these long periods of, of dryness. And so, um, um, what, what I want to understand better from that is these are both sort of survivors, right? They do well in these environments, but what is their function in the ecosystem? And so, um, you know, we have hypotheses because of the melanin that they may provide um, an important layer that protects the community, right? These black fungi may be almost like a sunscreen um, to if, if they're in a top layer that, that their melanin may be able to provide some protection to the fungi and the microbes that are, that are underneath it. But, um, you know, those are different hypotheses that we still have to um, fig figure out the right way to, to really test. But, but but at this level, we're trying to understand how they all interact. And so um, some other work that we do that kind of that kind of dovetails into this is both um, how these, uh, so I, I didn't show you, but so a, a similar type of analysis of the fungi over time, as well as um, um, more spatial understanding of how some of the different types of crusts are distributed and how the fungi and, and bacteria um, um, change there. And then we have kind of just adjacent to these sites, there are rocks and these rocks often have lichens on them. And we've sampled the lichens um, and we can, we can identify fungi that um, both the, of course, the dominant fungus that you see here, but also um, black fungi. Some of them are um, parasites of other fungi and we can find those as well as some of these black fungi are very much associated with the rocks. And so we're interested in kind of the, that, that whole um, cycle of those. Okay, so this is the story on on sort of dry environments, and then the rest are the other two stories are much shorter. But I wanted to give you a sense of kind of what what's been driving our questions using these tools. Um, and of course, I'm not talking about methods or techniques here, but we you know we use sequencing approaches um, and molecular approaches to try to um, uh, to to drive to, to drive these sample sampling and these interpretations. Um, so let's talk about another um, component of of bacterial fungal interactions that are more direct and measurable. And so um, it's, this is really another emerging field um, within mycology um, that probably has been, you know, uh, 10 or 15 years um, already of, of work, but um, we're really starting to appreciate that fungi are hosts for bacteria. And so here's a, a really beautiful micrograph with labels here of um, 
uh, endohyphal bacteria that inhabit inside the hyphae of um, a zygomycete fungus. And what we found is at least a lot of the a lot of the work has been has has revealed. Um, the zygomycete fungi tend to have a lot of associations with these bacteria, um, but it's not always, not totally understood what the impact to the fungal host is on, uh, by these, by these bacteria. And so um, these are, um, uh, some of these bacteria produce toxins that originally the fungus was thought to be the one that produced the toxin until later um, it was found that was actually the bacteria inhabiting the fungus. Um, and so that of course might change your control strategy in your, in your agricultural system if you're trying to prevent that. Um, and then also some of the bacteria can control the sexual reproduction of their host. And so again, these are really interesting patterns. So um, just, uh, this is not my work here. I'm showing you actually the slide from before. And this one is from a recently published paper, but um, you can see that um, these are different uh, lineages of fungi um, kind of grouped by number of strains tested. And when they look at these fungi, there are, you know, something between 10 to 20% of the, of the lineages that, that have the, have a bacterium tend to, um, that of the lineages that would harbor bacteria about 10 to 20% um, have a have a an identified bacteria in there, um, and so um, what we've been doing, as I mentioned before, with these zygo these genome sequencing, we're sequencing um, almost a thousand zygomycete fungi alone using kind of low coverage genome sequencing to help our phylogeny work. But what we also find is that these cultured fungi, these fungi from from culture collections, still have their endohyphal bacteria. So I call it bonus genomes because we're able to basically go in and grab and, and identify these other um, members of the community. And so we have, uh, I won't go into the details, but we do these, uh, you know, sort of um, pipeline approaches to make this um, fairly automated. Um, and then what we can identify about in our sort of 800 strains, we find about 75 strains that have a bacteria, but only about 25 of those produce really good assemblies because we weren't attend intending to sequence the bacteria. It was kind of an, an afterthought. But here's a phylogenetic tree of some of those. So this is a tree of the bacteria. Um, and, and this is kind of recapitulating some known, this, this mycetohabitants here and mycetohabitants here or have been sort of the, 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 the named and known strains that have been associated with this rhizopus fungi. Um, and you can see there are these two clades of these that we recover out of our uh, whole genome sequencing and then bacterial um, selection. So um, uh, this is uh, really cool because we can sort of use these data sets for additional questions. Um, and, um, and this is, a, you know, again, a, a unreadable, of course, but a tree of, of about 700 of those low coverage genomes, which is really our driving question, was trying to understand um, uh, these relationships of these fungi um, really filling in this part of the tree. Um, and um, um, so these are just some mentioning of some of these links of uh, these um, tools that we develop to try to automate these analyses approaches so we can, we can dig in deeper. So um, anyway, so this is to say that, that, there's experimental work, and then there's this kind of cataloging work that we're able to do to identify those. Um, and then another kind of driving question for us is how, how positive are these interactions? Um, and so um, one fung one bacteria called serratia um, that um, hopefully you might have heard of, um, you know, is you know very common in food spoilage, but also can cause some problems in humans. Um, some of these fungi, these bacteria also can kill fungi. And so here's work that really inspired us um, was these these images of serratia here attacking a rhizopus hyphae. And so understanding how they interact, how they kill was, was really, really neat to me. Um, and, but also work that um, Ben Wolf's lab, um, who, who has worked on cheese microbiomes and, and sort of the cheese as a model ecological system, along with Rachel Dutton, um, they developed some amazing systems that are also, of course, <laughs> edible lab, lab fun. But, um, but what Ben also um, has shown is that these, um, uh, and others too, have shown that these fungi are like highways for the bacteria. And so they um, can spread within the, the culture very quickly through those um, hyphae. And, and, and Ben's done some great work on showing kind of how these interactions um, kind of start and, and, and how, they, how they move around. So we tried to repeat some of those experiments. And so so my, my grad student started growing f fungi and serratia that we'd isolated, and he wanted to kind of get that point where they started to meet. But they, and so he was just setting up some first experiments, and he sort of struck, he was going to take a picture, uh, waiting for the fungi to get closer to the bacteria and take a picture, right? And he, and he, and he did that, and then it, and it, they never met, and he got frustrated. He's like, well, they're not meeting. Of course, we can sort of dab the bacteria on top of the hyphae, uh, but he wanted to kind of get that moment when they met. And so we kept doing this, and we did it with different strains of, of fungi and different strains of, of, of serratia that we had. 
had. You can see some serratia have this red prodigiosin derived color, some, some are white. Um, and so we were sort of noticing this variation. We said, well, okay, let's figure out what's going on. Why aren't they, why are they being, why are they inhibited in their growth? And so um, we did a couple of different experiments where we put bacteria in a, in a well. Um, and so they're not physically, we wanted to know if this was physical touching or something else. So they're separated physically. And these are all um, fungal inoculated wells. And you can see here by proximity that these um, fungi are not growing well, not growing um, um, as well in the, in the wells that are near to, near to the bacteria, but they're not touching. So then we inferred that there must be uh, some other um, volatile that's interacting there. And so we did, a, this is sort of a long, uh, a long uh, project that isn't, um, that we have a preprint on, but we have not uh, gotten the final publication out on. But um, here is these experiments that, that um, he decided to call a, a donut plate, although maybe it's a Berliner here, um, where you have um, a sort of an inside out, you have a fungus growing in a small plate in the middle, and you have, in this case, a control with nothing else growing, and you see the fungus growing fine. If you if you put bacteria um, around it uh, on, on a, in a sort of this, this other plate, and you leave the, the middle plate open, but you put, of course, you put a lid on the very top, so they have a shared head space, the fungus is repressed in its growth. If you put a lid on that in, internal one, it doesn't um, the growth is not suppressed very much. And so um, we kind of went down this approach to think that there, to understand that there are volatiles produced by those bacteria. Um, this is a very, very, very fancy setup where you have mason jars and air pushed through and you collect these, um, the, 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 the volatiles that are produced by the bacteria that are in these um, jars. And then we can do lots of work to analyze those compounds that are produced. And then we can identify some of the most abundant compounds and test those individually. And so you can see some of these different these are hyphae and some of the different impacts of those. And so um, what we kind of were able to do is sort of show that some of these different um, that, that, that the that some of these different compounds suppress the growth alone of the fungi. So we can just take a single compound and, and incubate the fungus in a, in a shared headspace with that and show that we get fungal growth suppression. So how these fungi are reacting to these volatiles is really cool to us. We can even use it kind of in a, in a thought process for say biocontrol. If you wanna protect your strawberries from getting mold sooner, um, an individual compound produced um, can suppress, this is I think after uh, uh, Seven, seven to 10 days, you can see that you see very little uh, fungal growth. So that's um, kind of motivating our, our research there. Um, and so um, both understanding the volatiles the bacteria produce and how the fungi sense them is what we're on the hunt for at this point. And so I just wanted to kind of give you a, a view of, of, that, of that work. Um, I know, I know I've just reached my, my time. Um, so I just want to give you one other really short story on the viruses, um, which is just that um, we, we, viruses have been important. Mycoviruses have been important. This is Cryphonectria, a fungus that um, has, has decimated um, um, the chestnut trees in the U.S. Um, but, uh, and, and, and there's been lots of efforts to try to develop mycoviruses as biocontrols for fungi. And so... Um, but understanding kind of the natural interactions between fungi and viruses is, is fascinating to us. And um, this is not my work, but um, uh, 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 there's efforts that have shown that there are um, viruses that interact with rhizopus fungi that both um, have this endosymbiont that we talked about before, this bacteria, but also that these bacteria and the, and the viral symbiont play a role in regulating the sexual reproduction. And these Narni viruses are, are, um, are kind of most recently described in this group. And so um, Le Layla's uh, lab's work has shown uh, this really amazing, um, you know, beautiful work about what uh, these new sort of diverse viruses. And so our, our other work, which I'm just going to give you the ta a taste of, and I won't, I won't get into, has been also using these genome sequencing and these um, transcriptional sequencing of what we call early diverging fungi, but the zygomycetes and the chytrid fungi in particular. And what we're finding is lots of viral diversity that had not been previously described within these groups of fungi. And so um, this is maybe more of like an advertisement for, hey, let's let's also see what's what's inhabiting these fungi besides the bacteria that we um, we know that there are viruses there. We don't know necessarily a phenotypic consequence of what 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 role they play, but that we think that these are important. Um, and um, we have a couple of stories that are emerging beyond this that that are just not, not not quite ready for prime time to tell. But I can just say that the sequencing approaches are letting us kind of investigate um, and, and, and identify these. So. Um, 
yeah, so basically screening culture collections as well as wild wild caught fungi are uh, important to, to be able to get a handle on those viruses that remain in there and understanding how, um, you know, these fungi, the kind of differences about these early diverging fungi is that a lot of them don't have septa that separate their cells. They're kind of seen, they're seen acidic, one big tube. And so does that, do they need to have different defense strategies and, and, and RNA, RNA defense, RNA type defense strategies for recognizing these and silencing them. Um, so um, hopefully I didn't take too long there for my, uh, than you wanted, but um, I wanted to give you kind of an overview of some of these interaction stories and just indicate these are both um, uh, collaborations that I've benefited greatly from from the, some of these different collaborators and these team team led projects, um, and uh, uh, hopefully hopefully you've got an appreciation for some of the different ways that we've tried to tackle fungi and used uh, genomic approaches to to get to the bottom of that. Um, so with that, I can stop, and I'd be happy to to take questions uh, from anybody who has any. Thank you so. Thank you so much, uh, Jason. That's fantastic, uh, amazing new world, uh, which your tools help us to discover.